going to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some of the women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer all these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See it as I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. The Gospel of the Lord. I was, um, I was about four and a half when I had my very first milkshake. And I was also about four and a half when I had my very first Happy Meal hamburger. So for many of you who know that I have been a vegetarian for a very long time, prior to that, I thought that the Happy Meal hamburger was the best thing since sliced bread. The reason I know that that was the time I had my first milkshake and hamburger is because we had that on New Year's Eve one time. And my parents had agreed to overnight babysit two other children so that their parents could go out and have like a grown-up's New Year's Eve. So those parents brought Happy Meals for the four children that were going to be staying, me and my brother and then their children. And we had, my brother and I had never, ever had McDonald's before. So they presented us, I don't actually remember this whole story, but my mom tells it, like it's one of those classic stories, right, that she tells about my brother and I. So they present us with this milkshake, never having had one before, and you go to drink out of a straw and a milkshake, it just doesn't come up very smoothly. So I have this vision of my brother and I sort of like looking at each other, like, what is this, some type of cruel joke? I mean, give us something we can't even drink. And um, the same with the hamburger. So I never had a hamburger that came out of a styrofoam box, because this was, you know, years ago when McDonald's still used styrofoam. For us, hamburgers only came off the grill, they only came out of the oven. So it was a really, really special thing for us that we got to have drive through food. <laughs> I am thinking that most kids nowadays and most parents 
probably don't remember their very first encounter with the golden arches. I know that having McDonald's in my family was sort of special when the kids were little, but it was mostly utilitarian. You know, on long road trips when we were traveling, I could get food really fast and we could keep on going. Or if the baseball game ran late, I could at least provide them something to eat that night. drive through restaurants helped me to manage my life. And not only that, um, as you may imagine, I have three children, and those of you who have more than one children will really be able to get this. I have three children who don't always like the same thing. I mean, imagine that, right? <laughs> so, so we could potentially actually go to Wendy's, which was sometimes Carter's choice because he's sort of like the higher caliber uh, hamburger. We could make it to Taco Bell, possibly, for Jackson, who liked Taco Bell, although the, the rest of us think it's high-grade dog food. <laughs> and then my, my youngest son, Cooper, he always wanted pizza. And so I could make everybody happy. They could all have their own meal. I could get my Diet Coke, and we could be on our way. drive throughs are sort of the picture of modernism and separatism and individualism. They aren't really the picture of being one in communion with everyone. As I was thinking about these uh, drive-thrus, I was wondering if anybody knows what the first drive-thru establishment was. <laughs> this is not actual, not actual fact, and it might be a little bit of a stretch in sort of my opinion. But um, the church... The church was the first drive through establishment, um, totally and completely unintentionally. Somehow this whole loaf that we used to all get a piece of became, we all get our very own little pre-processed wafer. And unintentionally, what we've said is we've disconnected everyone. The spirit of interconnectedness that that loaf represented became just a special thing only for you. I know that sometimes we need to drive through just to make our lives work. And I mean, my children will attest to sometimes there is just a pot of pasta sitting on the counter, and you better get a pot of pasta whenever you happen to be home because I'm going to drive up to the house, you're going to get in, and you're going to be on your way. And if you don't eat at some point, that's it for the night. But, and this may gross some of you out a little bit, but if I never stand close enough to you to get sick, if I'm never sharing a plate and a cup and all that comes with seated, being seated at a table with you, if I never have to slave over a meal just because it's the thing that you really love to eat, or if I never have to eat something that I totally dislike, then what I've done is I've separated myself from you. I've completely avoided you. And in doing so, I have avoided Jesus. From the wedding in Cana to the celebration of the return of the prodigal son, to Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners, to breaking bread at the Last Supper, Jesus loved to eat. It wasn't an afterthought, and it wasn't something to be rushed through, and it certainly wasn't something to be done by oneself. I think that it's really comical when I, read, when I read the lesson for today. It's really comical when you start to realize that today's reading takes place Easter evening. For us, Easter might seem like a long time ago, but this whole encounter happens Easter evening when he's risen from the dead. And he says, he says to them, he went in to stay with them. When he was with them at the table, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then, seemingly, just like 30 seconds later, we get this, as, it, as he appears to more of his followers in another house, in another town. While they were in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Apparently, rising from the dead really takes it out of you. <laughs> I... Uh, I always have to think of a tagline when we, when we post our, our sermons, you know? And so I was thinking, so if I were to tagline this, I would tagline it, Jesus Christ crucified, died, raised, hungry. and downright hungry. <laughs> hungry. <laughs> I mean, doesn't he have better things to do than eat? I 
feel like I figure there are plenty of people to heal. He could do something about global hunger. He could deal with political unrest. He could put some ointment on those wounds. So many things he could be doing. And I also, like, the sarcastic piece of me has got to wonder, I mean, does God need to eat? Surely he could do something about his grumbling belly. But the truth is, the gospel makes it clear that breaking bread is about more than satisfying your grumbling belly. Because things happen around the table. And this is something we all know, right? Like, I know at my kitchen table, when we are able to sit down, we talk about math class. Or we talk about the fight in the hallway. We've planned vacations. I have three boys. We've even discussed bodily functions more than once. <laughs> sometimes we have laughed so hard that we've cried. And sometimes we've fought at the table. Breaking bread is a term used for coming together over a meal in friendship and fellowship. Around the table, no matter what your bread happens to be, stories are told and friendships are made. Relationships can be restored and connectedness is given. Whether we're sitting across from each other at a table, around this communion table, or at a, on a picnic blanket, it really doesn't matter. A meal is a time to see and recognize the person that seated across from you. Because as we break bread together, we're also reminded of our commitment to one another. Jesus spent the last years of his life teaching that everyone is responsible for everyone else. And he called us all to partake of what he was serving. Because for Jesus, breaking bread wasn't just a way of eating. It was a way of living. No drive throughs no late-night pizza all by yourself. Food was meant to be communal. And too often, we end up driving through life. We lose the specialness of family time. We forget the gift of the stranger in our midst. And we lose the hunger for justice and the taste for mercy and the fellowship of being in community. If you remember earlier, I sort of joked that, you know, Jesus probably had other things to do rather than eat. I mean, he actually does. But he knows that in order for healing and justice and peace to occur, he has to sit down with us and have a meal with us and have a conversation. Easter morning is at the heart of what we believe. But Easter evening is no less important. When we come to his table, we hear this promise that here we all may feast with celebration and without shame. And he gathers us in, meeting our needs, our sorrows with bread and wine. But he doesn't just feed us on body and blood. Jesus feeds us with his hunger. He feeds us over and over again until we're hungry for the very same things that he's hungry for. When the disciples sit down with Jesus around the table, there has got to be a big, old conversation going on. Jesus has just risen. There's no way things are going to be the same now. And I believe that that's when the disciples realize that they better start setting a larger table. More people to invite. More people to serve. More people to feed. And I think that's where we are, too. Time to stop driving through, and time to sit across from one another. Time to say, what do people need to feast on? It's time to set a larger table. And I mean this in our own homes, but I also mean this in our church. Now before I go on, I want to tell you that I have this one really big pet peeve with sermons. And believe me, I have heard enough sermons in my life and given enough sermons um, that I... I know what drives me crazy about them. So I could be listening to a pastor, and I'll be all on board with what they're talking about. Like, I'll be like, yes, food for all. Yes, save the world. Yes, justice, mercy, all that stuff. I can, yes, yes, yes. And then I'm like, what the heck do I do with that? <laughs> you know, and then I'm like back to my wafer, right? And I've got this individual wafer, and I don't know what to do with it. I absolutely cannot do all of those things on my own. And neither can you. And that's why Jesus has a whole bunch of disciples seated around the table. 
And I believe that Jesus has recently asked Prince of Peace this very important question. And it is, what's on the menu? He has put on the hearts and minds of the people here the task of figuring out what Prince of Peace is serving. And this is absolutely something we have to figure out. This is, and it's going to be a really hard menu to plan. But I also trust that when we sit around the table with all of our collective knowledge and our dreams and our ideas, that they will all feed one another. And we need everyone to eat, everyone to sit, everyone to bake, everyone to break. And the good news about this is that people here are talking about those things. What and how and to whom we're serving. I know that this may not be on the top of your uh, reading list, so like, not this past newsletter, but the last newsletter, I had asked for people if you have um, connections in the community. And they can, somebody uh, contacted me and said, yeah, they, they work with the Boy Scout troop. That's like great. If you have connections, it can be you are a teacher at a school. It can be you participate in a library. It can be you belong to this gardening club, this whatever. It doesn't matter. But I would love to know what those are. And Pastor Steve would love to know those. And your church council. Not because we want to know what your hobbies are. We are interested in that. But those are places where there's already connection made. Already communion going on. And what we want to do as a body of Christ is to broaden the communion table. Not to actually feed, feed them. I mean, yes, sometimes. But to say, okay, how can we all work together to do all those things that Jesus cares about? And so if you have ideas, please email them to me. Don't be shy. Even if you think this is far out, like I'm all about the far out idea. <laughs> There's one thing that we all know, and you know it too, is that we never want to eat alone. Nobody likes to do that. And there are a lot of people eating literally and figuratively alone. And we can't feed them all. I have no delusions of that. And Jesus does not expect us to feed every single person. But he does expect one thing of us. He does expect us to take this altar and set it out there in the world. So I believe that it's time to set the table.